Mr. President, this, this week is uh, Sunshine Week, a week when we applaud open government and when we celebrate the institutions that hold government accountable. Throughout our nation's history, one of the most important has been the, the press, the free press. Donald Trump, as candidate and president, has repeatedly attacked the press. He has called it the enemy of the people. He's labeled the national media outlets as fake news. And he has criticized respected reporters who have reported for years. He has singled out mainstream newspapers like the New York Times, Politico, and the Los Angeles Times, and television outlets like ABC, NBC, CBS, CNN. That's how this president operates. He acts like a bully, not just with the media. He attacks the courts when Article III judges disagree with him and when they find he is breaking the law. He attacks sitting judges for deciding against him, even those appointed by Republican presidents. Without basis, he attacks our intelligence agencies. And he even demeans career public servants who risk their lives to keep our nation safe. The president's goal is obvious, to undermine institutions in our country who threaten him, who criticize him. Authoritarians have used this strategy for centuries and continue to do so today in countries where democracy is weak or non-existent and where autocracy or kleptocracy is strong. But this is the United States. We are an example to the world of democratic principles in action. The President's repeated attacks on our democratic institutions need to stop, and they need to stop now. A free and robust press is critical for democracy to work, period, end of story. Our nation's history of a free press dates back to our founding. Free press in the colonial United States developed in reaction to severe restrictions on free, pre free speech in England. During the latter half of the 17th century, all books and articles were required to be licensed by the government to be published. Then, seditious, seditious libel, bringing hatred or contempt upon the crown or the parliament by written word, was a criminal offense. So to speak against the crown was a criminal offense. Truth was not a defense. No publication could criticize the crown or the government, even if it was accurate. The first new newspapers and colonies operated under license from the colonial governor. But by 1721, James Franklin, Benjamin Franklin's older brother, was publishing one of the first colonial independent newspapers. The New England Current in Boston, Ben Franklin was his apprentice, typesetter, and sometimes contributed under pen names. Several years later, Ben Franklin began publishing his own independent newspaper, the Pennsylvania Gazette. His new newspaper became the most popular in the colonies and was published until 1800. By 1735, the tenets of seditious libel were coming undone. John Peter Singer, publisher of the New England, the New York Weekly Journal, ran articles harshly critical of the colonial government. Zinger was arrested and tried for libel. While he admitted he published the articles, his lawyer argued truth was a defense. The press, the lawyer argued, and, and the, the, uh, the press, the lawyer argued, has, quote, a liberty both of exposing and opposing tyrannical power by speaking and writing the truth. The judge, however, instructed the jury as to the law at the time that Zinger must be found guilty if he published the articles, whether truthful or not. But after 10 minutes of deliberation, the jury acquitted Zinger. These were some of the beginnings of a free press in our nation. The first rights in the Bill of Rights our freedom of religion, the press, speech, petition, and assembly. The press as an institution is expressly protected by the Constitution. 
In 1789, the drafters of the Bill of Rights understood that a free press was essential to the growth and success of our new democracy. They understood that debate, disagreement, the free flow of ideas make an informed public. That the press helps educate voters. They understood all too well that government power needed to be checked and that the press holds the powerful in check by investigating and exposing arbitrary conduct, abuse, and corruption. A democracy cannot exist without a free press. It's as simple as that. But our president doesn't seem to understand this, or he doesn't care. According to him, the press is, quote, dishonest, not good people, sleazy, and among the worst human beings. Those are all quotes by our president. Established press organizations are the fake news. And a few weeks ago, he declared the press, quote, an enemy of the people. We haven't heard attacks like this since Watergate. And even then, it wasn't so much so fast. The president's subordinates are now given license to accuse and to limit press access. Chief strategist Steve Bannon said the press should, quote, keep its mouth shut and just listen for a while. Mr. President, this quote from Mr. Bannon has extra significance today because he is no longer the head of a right-wing media company In a controversial move, President Trump issued an executive order to add him to the National Security Council's Principals Committee. Today, we are going to vote on the nomination of General McMaster to retain his three-star general status while serving as the head of the National Security Council. I do not believe a political extremist like Mr. Bannon should serve on the council. At a minimum, General McMaster should direct Mr. Bannon to stop attacking the free press while serving on the council. Senior advisor Kellyanne Conway called for media media organizations to fire reporters who criticized candidate Trump. Press Secretary Sean Spicer barred the New York Times and the Los Angeles Times, BuzzFeed and Politico from a press conference. And the Secretary of State will now travel without the press corps, disregarding a decades-old practice. Now, don't get me wrong. The press doesn't always get it right. They make mistakes. News organizations have their biases. Mistakes should be corrected, and bias should be tempered by using accepted journalistic methods and professional judgment and following journalism's ethics code. But mistakes and the exercise of professional judgment are not the same thing as reporting fake news. The president's Republican colleagues have been too silent in the face of attacks. Few in Congress have stood up against the president's hostility to the press. Government officials are afraid to disagree. Just last week at a Senate Commerce hearing, I asked the FCC chair, Mr. Pye, A yes or no question, does he agree with the president that the press is the enemy of the people? He did not engage. He would not answer. He let stand the president's remarks. The president's characterization of the press as the enemy is reminiscent of President Nixon. And Nixon said, I quote, never forget. The press is the enemy, the press is the enemy, the press is the enemy, end quote, as recorded in his secret tapes. The press was Nixon's enemy because the press exposed his criminal conduct, which led to his resignation. The press is Trump's enemy because the press exposes his and his associates' ties to Russia. The president's myriad Trump organization conflicts of interest his constant barrage of misrepresentations of fact. Nixon's press secretary called the Washington Post's investigative reporting shoddy and shabby journalism. 
like President Trump's accusation of fake news, that same Post reporting won the paper a Pulitzer Prize. Watergate was a break-in of the Democratic National Committee during the presidential campaign, and Nixon had ordered his chiefs of staff to have the CIA block the FBI's investigation into the source of the funding for the Watergate burglary. During his last presidential election, we had a cyber, during this last presidential election, we had a cyber break-in of the DNC. And even, even after 17 U.S. intelligence agencies concluded Russia hacked the DNC to sway the election, candidate Trump refused to accept their analysis. The President's Chief of Staff pressured the FBI to publicly deny that Trump associates had contact with the Russians. While his chief counsel reportedly breached the firewall seeking information from the FBI about investigation into the president and his associates. And since the press began to look hard at the ties between President Trump, the Trump Organization, his associates, and Russia, the president has not let up on his criticism. Just last week, the president threatened by tweet, and I quote, it is amazing how rude much of the media is to my very hardworking representatives. Be nice, you will do much better. The job of the press isn't to be nice. It's to gather the facts and report them. Now that the President of the United States has called the reputable U.S. news organizations fake news, others are doing the same. Russia's foreign ministry spokesman recently accused a CNN reporter of spreading, and I quote, fake news, because the reporter asked about accusations from U.S. officials that the Russian ambassador is a spy. This is a dangerous path. Putin has throttled an independent press in the Russian Federation, imposing restriction after restriction on the news media. Reporters have been harassed, threatened, and jailed. The numbers of truly independent media organizations in Russia have been reduced to a very few. And they have re been replaced by state-owned, state-run news media, like RT, formerly known as Russia Today, a propaganda bullhorn for Putin, according to Secretary John Kerry. The president admires Putin, and I quote the president here as a strong leader, Putin has used his strength to silence an independent press. We do not want our press silenced. Justice Brandeis, in a famous defense of free speech in a 1927 First Amendment case, said, and I quote, those who won our independence by revolution were not cowards. They did not fear political liberty. Does President Trump fear political liberty? The irony of the president's accusations of fake news is that he himself has spread misinformation and fanned the flames of internet-driven lies, from questioning President Obama's citizenship to his frivolous claim that millions of people committed voter fraud, and he really won the popular vote. That's his claim, the president, that he really won the popular vote and to the president's unsubstantiated accusation that President Obama wiretapped Trump Tower. We have entered into an era in U.S. politics never seen before in my lifetime. We cannot allow this to be sanitized or explain it away. The phrase alternative facts has become a national joke because it sounds like something from George Orwell's 1984. It's not acceptable for a president to falsify, misrepresent, or flat out lie. The president's party and Congress should not allow this. They should not look the other way and continue to profess that the emperor's clothes are grand. Reacting to Mr. Trump's attacks on the press, President George W. Bush responded, and I quote, I consider the media to be indispensable to democracy. We need an independent media to hold people accountable. Power can be very addictive, 
and corrosive. And it's important for the media to hold to account people who abuse their power, whether it be here or elsewhere. End quote on President George W. Bush's recent comment. President Bush's prescription for democracy in 2017 is the same as the drafters of the First Amendment in 1789. A free and independent and robust media is essential to democracy. And any broad-based attack on the press is an attack directly on our democracy. There's one thing President Trump must understand. The press won't go away. They won't stop reporting on the actions he takes and on the decisions he makes. He can spend the next four years attacking the press, but they will still be there, just like they were after Nixon resigned.